everyone. Thank you so much for joining my talk today, this afternoon. Uh, so I'm a research fellow in technology and finance at Oxford University at Said Business School within our uh, Oxford of Future Finance and Technology Center. So today I will introduce you to the evolution of stable coins. I will start with uh, key definitions uh, and what actually we mean by stable coins. Stable coins known as uh, programmable types of cryptocurrencies which uh, peg their value to different types of assets. And depending on the types of assets, we can define four types of stable coins which exist now. So probably most of you know fiat pegged stable coins. Usually it's uh, US dollar pegged stable coins like Tether and uh, Circle uh, pro uh, products. Uh, then we also have uh, commodity uh, pegged stable coins. Uh, we have uh, crypto backed stable coins, and we also have algorithmic stable coins, which actually don't rely on any particular collateral. So, behind all these stable coins, of course, we have organizations which we call stable coin issuers. So, actually, how they create revenues. So, uh, we can define two main types of revenues here. Main one uh, is the interest income. Uh, usually, this interest comes from holding large volumes of. Um, cash or cash equivalent assets uh, in the bank accounts. And then we have um, uh, transaction fees, different types of fees, for example, transaction fees and uh, any other types of fees here. So uh, stable coins actually exist in, in two markets. So the primary market uh, where stable coins are minted and redeemed, and the secondary market where actually traded. So it can be uh, DeFi platforms and uh, centralized uh, cryptocurrency exchanges. So um, here you can see uh, uh, several stages uh, of uh, stable coin evolution. Yeah. So I'm not going to go into every stage in details, but I will start from the very first stage, so which I call stable coin pioneers. So stable coins has uh, have a history of uh, 10 plus years. So uh, the first one was created in 2014. It's actually when we uh, have uh, this this idea of um, stable coin actually a cryptocurrency backed by an asset was created this idea and then also in 2014 Tether was launched, yes, yeah, so the largest stablecoin issuer and actually it's this, uh, also the first time when we started to speak about um, uh, fiat-backed uh, stablecoins. Another interesting uh, year here is 2019 when Facebook, now Meta, announced uh, their global level stablecoin products, uh, uh, which actually attracted lots of attention from central banks and actually gave that push for central banks to start work with their own central bank digital currencies. And of course, the current stage, uh, which is slowly moving to mainstream adoption, uh, driven by new use cases, a new players entering the space, and also uh, 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 regulatory, um, um, also development of regulatory frameworks uh, in different countries, and also just last week we saw Circle's IPO. So um, this uh, all backed by uh, numbers. Uh, so some interesting stats here. Uh, one is uh, that. Um, uh, Stablecoin issues are in top 20 direct holders of U.S. Treasuries, so ahead of uh, Germany and Mexico, for example. Uh, another interesting stat that we have more than 200 uh, stablecoins uh, actually traded uh, at the moment, and of course all the volumes and uh, market capitalizations are growing, and the forecast expectation that by 2020 it will reach almost 4 billion uh, U.S. dollars. So. Um, after providing you with very, very quick uh, introduction into numbers, into definitions, so now we can speak about evolutionary pathways, uh, and actually the topic of this talk is how stable coins are actually connecting crypto world and traditional finance. So here we define three of them. Of course, they're all not independent, so they, of course, uh, depend on each other, but it's just interesting and useful to look into them, to zoom into them, um, as a separate pathway, as I call it here. So the first one, uh, uh, the, I call it uh, evolutionary pathway through the development of new use cases and uh, driven by the entry of new players. So um, stablecoin actually uh, was a response uh, to the demand from uh, DeFi world. Uh, in DeFi world, um, um, organizations and uh, those who were playing there, they needed some reliable um, 
means of payment, uh, stability as well, stable means of payment, and that's how actually stablecoin was created. It's still a big, uh, uh, plays a big role there, but of course we all know that now stablecoins are actually effectively used in remittances, uh, cross-border payments, also uh, they're used in uh, some government projects, uh, they're used for delivery of aid as well. So uh, we see that the expansion of use cases show that actually Stablecoins becoming a very reliable means of payment in also traditional finance. So this is all driven, uh, partly driven by the entry of new players. Uh, some large institutions just recently announced that they, if uh, regulatory clarity will be there, they will also uh, enter this ecosystem. So the large banks, uh, asset management companies, also um, uh, players like, for example, Ripple and other companies which already have uh, existing ecosystem where they see direct use, direct use cases of stablecoin within their own existing ecosystem of products. And actually some voices um, also saying that Meta probably would like to see their second Libra moment very soon. So um, the second evolutionary pathway which uh, drives stablecoins towards traditional finance and its regulatory dynamics. So, of course, we exist now in financial services. They exist in financial services, which uh, means that this is very highly regulated uh, sector of economy, and regulation is the uh, very important pillar of this uh, ecosystem. So, but only four countries now in the world actually have um, stablecoin frameworks. Uh, Japan was one of the first ones, uh, and then uh, Singapore, uh, UAE, and uh, European Union, they followed the uh, steps. So uh, at the moment, we can say that uh, the US, uh, Hong Kong, are moving ahead uh, with their regulatory frameworks, and most probably it will happen this summer. UK also followed their steps, but it will take a bit of time, but the conversation started there as well. So uh, there are, of course, some universal areas of concerns, uh, which uh, universal across the board, yes? So for example, reserve management, uh, risk management. So these are the areas that um, uh, regulators would like to address in their frameworks. But while being universal, the definitions and the requirements uh, in all these countries, even within the existing regulatory frameworks, they're all different. So, for example, in Japan, uh, the definition of the stablecoin issue is very strict. For example, it's only limited to uh, licensed banks or, and other highly regulated financial institutions, while in other jurisdictions, the definition of stablecoin issue can be a little bit more flexible. So this means that while it creates some regulatory clarity, it's not going to harmonize uh, the regulation on a global level. It basically creates regulatory complexity at this stage. However, so uh, as uh, we all hear, so to have regulation is good, not to have regulation and have uncertainty is not good for businesses. So in most cases, the regulatory developments are welcome from stablecoin ecosystem. So, and uh, the last uh, pathway here is, of course, coevolution with other types of uh, digital assets. And here I bring the uh, direct, uh, similar probably type of digital assets, which is digital money from central banks. So, of course, we don't have uh, any example on a global level at the moment, but the conversation, of course, uh, are um, going and many central banks are researching this area. We also have three cases of CBDC is already launched. So probably in the near future, we may see some um, CBDCs coming into the market. And of course, they will shape each other because stablecoin basically is the digital money coming from the private sector and CBDC is the digital form of money coming from the uh, public sector issued by the central bank. And just here, just for you, like a quick summary of how it can uh, co-evolve in the future. They can compete. They can, of course, co-evolve and and uh, complement each other, or they can stay in their own niches um, and uh, satisfy a particular need. So um, just to uh, finish my talk here with a more uh, historical lens, uh, going back into history of money, actually money is built on trust. Yeah? Money can be defined as a social agreement that a particular form, physical or at the moment digital, will be accepted and adopted by the society. And uh, here we can say that stablecoins are actually not a new form of money, it's a new trust protocol which uses algorithms, technology, um, um, adjusted or um, 
optimized for speed, programmability, and interoperability, these features that needed now for, for this uh, moment of time. And uh, probably, hopefully, so through more trust building, through regulation, through next uh, stage of uh, technology infrastructure and integration, we may see a new ecosystem of financial services where crypto exchanges, uh, traditional financial institutions, uh, and other stakeholders will all find their roles and niches, and maybe stable coins actually will become those threads which will connect them. And I will just fi finish with the quote from uh, William Gibson here that the future uh, is already here, it's just not evenly distributed, meaning that elements of the payment systems, forms of money, how people and uh, organizations will interact with money and payments are uh, already here. And we now, you as developers, as uh, uh, companies, crypto companies and mm, regulators, you're already assembling the future that we will see now. Next. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, any questions, please let me know. If you would like to stay connected, so here's my email address. I will be happy to share more insights. Thank you so much. <laughs>